Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Just to kind of recap where we've been, we've been walking through a series on the core values of Redeeming Grace Baptist Church. And so we've been walking through each one each week for the last several weeks now. We started off with gospel clarity, then we moved to the core value of biblical community, and then what it means, core value number three, to have committed disciples. Last week we considered God-centered worship, and today we're looking at core value number five, which we call deliberate simplicity. Deliberate simplicity. Now, that one, among all the others, may sound odd to you, kind of sounds odd to me. What, what do we mean by deliberate simplicity? Is it the decorations? Is this why we're kind of plain in here? I don't know. What does it mean? It's not what it means. Uh, that's due to funding, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, what does it mean when we think about deliberate simplicity? Well, let me kind of define that for us up front, and then we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. What we mean when we say deliberate simplicity is this. While valuing excellence, Redeeming Grace Baptist Church strives to be simple in our ministry methodology. Instead of providing an ever-increasing number of programs, we strive to put our best efforts toward fostering an ecosystem of church cultures in disciplines such as evangelism, discipling, hospitality, and fellowship that encourages ministry to develop organically with minimal programming. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? That's what we mean when we say deliberate simplicity. And we're going to kind of unpack that today as we look at Ephesians chapter 4 and see what it is that God has for us as the body of Christ. I want to begin reading in Ephesians chapter 4 here in verse 1 as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Instead, or excuse me, in saying, he ascended, what does it mean that but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended, the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for this word this morning that we see from Paul. Lord, we thank You that You instruct us in the Scriptures about what it means to be Your people in this world. Father, as we think through this core value of deliberate simplicity this morning, would You help us understand what we mean by that and what, what, what the Scripture ultimately and truly calls us to do as the church? So, Lord, would You give us wisdom now as we open Your Word and we think through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, do you tend towards being a hoarder or a minimalist? Most of us are likely somewhere in the middle, but we tend towards one direction or the other. A quick visit to your house this afternoon would prove that true. Now, I know that clutter is something that tends to accumulate in our homes, and the longer we live, the more we often accumulate. Right? We always get shocked when we are in a place for 10, 15, 20 years and we move all of a sudden. Where did all this stuff come from? The more we go about living, the more we accumulate. But it's not just in our homes. That is true also 
in our lives as people. It's, it's this strange paradox of sorts that, that, that as technology has increasingly made things easier and more accessible, we are busier and more cluttered than ever. You ever thought about that? I mean, things have gotten dramatically easier, and yet we've tended to make things a whole lot more complicated and cluttered than we should. That is not just true for our homes. That's not just true in our lives. That can also be true in the church. In their book, Simple Church, Tom Rainer and Eric Geiger write, many churches, quote, many churches have become cluttered so cluttered that people have a difficult time encountering the simple and powerful message of Christ, so cluttered that many people are busy doing church instead of being the church. read that book many, many years ago, and if I'm honest, it was a book that was really kind of influential in my own thinking about ministry because I think that that is often true that churches are often busy doing instead of reflectively being. And that's what we want to avoid here at Redeeming Grace. We don't want to be a church that is cluttered with a lot of stuff to do and forget the calling that God has given us so that we can be. A cluttered ministry where people are always busy of doing things instead of being encouraged and equipped We want to be deliberately simplistic with that regard. And that's really what's what's behind this core value of deliberate simplicity. This core value doesn't really speak to one ministry expression or the other. It rather kind of paints over all of them. It kind of sets the tone, if you will, of how we approach ministry here at Redeeming Grace. It really gets to the heart of the kind of culture that we strive and aspire to build at Redeeming Grace. Not saying we've arrived by any stretch of the imagination. Not saying that we do this really well. But rather, this core value does try to set the tone of how we go about developing and growing ministry and informing what we try to accomplish as the church. And really, that's the the main point today that I want to get at, and I think we see a a snapshot of here in Ephesians chapter 4, is that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to prioritize a healthy culture that encourages faithful living and fruitful lives. That's what we want to go after as, as Christians and as a church, to be a healthy church culture that encourages faithfulness and fruitfulness in the Christian life, and even as we carry out the mission and ministry of the church. So this morning, the way we're going to look at this passage um, is perhaps a little different than if we were preaching through the book of Ephesians. There's a lot in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, and we're not going to be unpacking it verse by verse. What I want us to do is kind of look at it kind of as a broad overview and kind of hit some big highlights of what the Lord through Paul is saying about the church and to the church at Ephesus that we can glean some insight from as far as what kind of culture is it that we want to try to set and establish as a church. And in order to do that, we're going to make three observations about the type of culture we're called to pursue as a church, and then from those characteristics of culture, we're going to draw out some inferences that speak directly to this core value of deliberate simplicity. That's my prayer and hope, all right? Let's look at this together. Three observations that we're called to with regard to church culture. Number one, we're called to a distinct culture. We're called to be a distinct culture, and you really kind of get that 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 uh, impression here in verses 1 through 6. The first three chapters of this letter, Paul has written of the wonders of God's saving grace. He has really just unpacked kind of a miniature of Romans. He does here in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3, just kind of unpacks the beauty of the gospel and what God has done in his grace to save, secure, redeem a people for himself by creating this new community, a community, by the way, that now brings both Jews and Gentiles into as one because of the grace given us in Christ. And Paul's point now in chapter 4 is that on the basis of this grace that's formed this new community, 
a new community that's given us a new identity, Paul begins to instruct them in how they're to go about as Christians within this new, newly formed community. And we see some things here that are, think, are, are important. And it's really in this chapter, in chapter 4, that Paul transitions from expounding on the grace of God to showing some pretty important implications by way of exhortation that flow from the reality of who we are in Christ. He says, I therefore, that key connecting word, therefore, because of what I've just said in the first three chapters, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He's just talked about the calling in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And he's saying now, because of this, in view of this, you need to live this way. And so he emphasizes this walk. He says, I urge you to walk. And he's using this language, this word walk. He's, he's really describing the Christian life, how we go about living as Christians. And two things that we can take note of here from Paul's exhortation, the things that he points out that I think ought to, to characterize such a walk uh, with regards to being a distinct culture. He's, he's, first of all, highlights the distinct relationships that we have. Notice he says, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. It's interesting, Paul says, walk, he's basically saying, I'm urging you, I'm exhorting you to walk in a way that's reflective of this grace that you've received. And one of the immediate things he hits here is how that's fleshed out in context of relationships with one another. Scripture places a premium on how we're called to love one another and to care for one another in selfless ways. And the reason I say this is distinct is because we do not see this in the world. This is not how the world lives, humble, gentle, patient, and bearing with one another. That's not how it works out there, is it? That's not, that's, so when we start living in this kind of way, it's distinct. Distinct from the selfishness that we see portrayed in the world. These kinds of virtues require a deliberate self-denial where we seek the good and well-being of others and not our own first. And that's only accomplished by the grace of God in our hearts. These virtues remind us that God does care how we relate to one another, how we do life together. The way we're called to relate is really, again, it's something really strange to the world, the world's culture is one that prioritizes self-expression, self-advancement, look out for number one, but that's not the kind of community that Christians are called to form. The kinds of things that we're called to do look like in context of relationship, lives of humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another in love. And you think about these, these terms, these, these, these virtues. These can only be practiced in the context of Christian relationship and community. Like it's hard to be humble and gentle and patient and bearing with others if you're not in context and community, in the context of community or in relationship to others. Like just living a, a, an isolated life, what's the, where's the need for humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another? So we see how Scripture places a premium on the importance of relationships. We're going to come back to that as we think about how that influences deliberate simplicity. You know, oftentimes we have limited our interaction with other Christians based on a time and a location, namely now, right? A lot of times Christians have, have really built their idea of Christian community around a scheduled event at a church facility. Now, certainly these virtues that we look at here in Ephesians 4 verse 2 can be practiced on a Sunday morning. They can be. You can practice humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another. You're doing that now as you're listening to me. You're bearing with me by listening, right? We can practice that on a Sunday. But listen, Paul's getting at more than an hour, hour and a half here. He's talking about how this ought to characterize the entirety of our lives. 
So this idea of Christian community, back to core value number two, biblical community, is, is something that we need to prioritize when it comes to the, the, the reality of relationships. Relationships are developed, and our Christian walk is fleshed out in the day-to-day relationships we have with other Christians. So that means getting together for dinner, for coffee, for, for hanging out, for going to the baseball game together, for chasing kids through the park together, whatever it is, right? Christian community is not just when we get together for Bible study, but it's when we're just simply living life together as fellow Christians in a dark and and chaotic world, reflecting the light of Christ as we encourage each other and go about the day-to-day life God has called us to. And that's exactly what makes us distinct. We are distinct in how we relate to each other. Even when we disagree and even when we have conflict, how we care for, how we love for each other really matters and says a lot. But not only are we called to this distinct relationship, we're called to a distinct unity. As we walk this way in relationship to one another, we should do so in a manner, Paul says, that is, verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. This is a unity that the Spirit has achieved and accomplished, and we are called to maintain it. Not only maintain it, to be eager to maintain it. There's a clear clear message to us here that, that what we are built upon matters. There's a clear foundation on which the church is established. You see it here in Ephesians 4, where he calls us to maintain the unity of the Spirit. He goes on in verse 4 through verse 6 and says, There's one body, one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Seven times the word one here is used. One God, one gospel, one church is basically his point. And our unity flows from this. This is what our unity is based on. And so, we are a distinct culture relating to each other in selfless ways because God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, has established this new culture that's centered on the truth of who God is and what God has done through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we have one here, one God, one gospel, one people. We're called to be distinct in our unity. Distinct because of how this vast diversity of people that exist in the world now called through this one gospel forms a new culture, a new identity where we relate with one another based on the truth of who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. Regardless of our cultures, our race, our backgrounds, our socioeconomic standing, God through the gospel places us together in community and makes us one. Therefore, we are a gospel people, distinct in our unity. As a church, what unites us is is not all the things that churches want to base their unity on today. What unites us here is not worship style. What unites us here is not the way that we do children's ministry or whether or not we even have children's ministry. What unites us here is not a preferred way of doing evangelism or a preferred way of doing discipleship. What unites us here is Christ. What unites us here is the truth of who God is and what He's done for us in the gospel. That's what brings us together and makes us one. Too often churches can lose sight of this, and they seek to build ministry around certain ministry expressions and not the gospel itself. And that's what we want to try to avoid. We don't want to be, if, if, if what we want our reputation in the community to be is simply, they believe the gospel. They believe the truth of who Jesus is. We don't want to be known as this church that does this ministry really well, or that's the church you go to if you want that Now, we want to be the church that you go to if you want the gospel. And we know there are other faithful churches in our community that preach the gospel, and we thank God for them and pray for them regularly. But listen, that's what we're called to be, distinct in our unity, that we are unified on substance, and that substance we find in the Lord. Listen, we can do a bunch of things as a church, and we probably will, and we have, and we'll continue to do things. 
We'll do ministry. We'll do things together. Some of those will be scheduled events. Some of them will be spontaneous. Some of them will be, be ongoing. Some of them will be one-time things. And we can do a bunch of things a bunch of different ways as a church. We can have all kinds of good and helpful ministries and activities. And those things will come and go through the years. But listen, we don't build our church around those things. We build the church on Christ and him crucified and risen and coming again. That's what we build on. Now, more about that in a minute. So deliberate, deliberate culture means that we are um, distinct, but that leads me to the second point, which is what I'm saying already as a deliberate culture. And you see kind of a snapshot of that in, in verses 7 through 13. We're distinct, but we're deliberate. Paul exhorts the church to maintain this unity. He recognizes how the church goes about it through the use of their gifts. Just notice the flow of thought here of Paul. He's talking about this unity, that we're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one God, one body, one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, who's over all, through all, and in all. And then verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us, each one of us according to the measure of of Christ's gifts. Grace has been given to each individual, he says, that is now all of these individuals that have been unified in the truth of who God is through Christ, and we've been given gifts. In other words, just as we said a few weeks back in the message on the core value of biblical community, each one of us has received a gift from the Lord for the good of this local body and the good of the gospel, the glory of God. And we're called for the good of the church and for the glory of God to utilize these gifts to maintain the unity of the church for the advancement of God's purposes in the world. So the point being is this, God has graciously saved us and God has graciously gifted each and every one of us who call him Lord so that within the body of Christ, we can use these gifts. You see that in verses 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. And then you get to verse 11. And you, we know this passage, and not only has God given each individual, we know that he's called and gifted leaders. You see the list there. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. He's given them to do what? Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. Did you know that each and every one of us have been called to the ministry? Right? It's not just these paid vocational pastors and leaders that you that you recognize, but every single one of us have been gifted, and pastors and shepherds have been put into place to equip you as ministers to serve for the good of the body. I think we often read a text like this, or maybe this very text, and say, well, yes, of course, God has gifted pastors and teachers, others, to equip those who are called to serve in ministry, as if there's only some who are called to serve in ministry. And what this text is saying is, if you're a Christian you have one, the Holy Spirit in you. You have two, a gift given to you, and you are called to minister that gift for the good of the church and for the glory of God. This text reminds us that all of us have been gifted and all of us need equipping so all of us can do ministry. And that's the kind of culture that we aspire to cultivate here at Redeeming Grace. Growing disciples, unified in the gospel, trained and equipped to serve together for the building up of the church and for the advancement of the gospel and the making of disciples. I've always said that while churches may have various ministry expressions, and I think contextualization is important. We need to think through the context we're in and the, how we apply the truth of God's Word in a particular given context or even culture. That The Word doesn't change. Maybe methods will change from time to time based upon that. But listen, I've always said that every church that believes the Bible, believes the gospel, has the same mission, right? 
We don't have to be creative. It's make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching, etc. And we want to do that well, but what we often do is we develop ministries, and rightfully so, that help us accomplish that, that goal. And what we often find is churches approaching ministry from this top-down mentality, meaning that the paid staff comes up with a bunch of ideas and programs, they implement those ideas and programs, and then scramble to get people involved and support these programs. And while there may be a place for that, and we do that, we attempt to pursue a bit of a different approach here. We value ministry that is more organic and grassroots, that's kind of built from the ground up. And what that means is that that we want to take a good, hard look at the people God has assembled in this community, and we want to train this people, equip this people, and mobilize this people, gifted by the Spirit, to go about ministry, using your gift. You know, throughout the years, one of the ways that this kind of applies, an example, throughout the years I've had lots of people ask me, hey, have we ever thought about doing fill-in-the-blank ministry? And depending on the day you catch me, you'll get various responses. You know, because sometimes I'm like, yeah, that'd be a great idea. I just, who's going to do it? So what I'll often say is, you know, that'd be a great idea. That would fit really well within our mission. Are you volunteering to lead it? And quickly the idea dies, right? But that's really what we want. You got a great idea. You've got the gifts to make that happen. It fits within what we want to be as a church. Let's go after it. What resources do you need? How can we help equip and mobilize people to, to come along that? To, to come along with you to, to serve in that way. You see, ministry is not meant to come up with a bunch of ideas, pay the staff to implement these ideas, and accomplish it. That's the way you burn people out really fast, especially when we see biblically that we're all in the ministry together. All of us have gifts. Our job, our role, is to equip you to do the ministry, right? You don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says we pay the pastors to do the ministry, It's the pastors are called to get you engaged and equipped to serve. And I'm thankful that we see the fruit of that here at Redeeming Grace. This is not a sermon saying we do bad at that. I think we do good, but we can always do better, right? We can always do better. We are all in this ministry together, and we want to serve the Lord faithfully. We want to be a deliberate culture. Yes, distinct in who we are, how we relate, what we believe, but deliberate in how we deploy the gifts that God has given this faith community here at Redeeming Grace. And then number three, we want to be a devoted culture, a devoted culture. This pursuit of unity, the employment and deployment of spiritual gifts within the church all points and results in a church community that is marked by growth. And I don't necessarily mean numerically. When we talk about growth, we're talking about a different kind of growth. People in seats isn't always necessarily a sign of success, right? So we want to be a devoted culture that prioritizes gospel growth, seeing Christians growing in their walk with God. Notice several things in Paul's argument here about uh, the church. He's talking about the, the leaders equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all, he says in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Right? What is one of the things that the Scripture places a premium on? Relationships, yes, but maturity, growth, health, thriving, flourishing. Right? That's what we see here. Until we all attain the unity of the faith to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Spiritual maturity is not just for you as an individual, though we are called to that individually, but here he's talking in the context of a church. We want to be a spiritually mature church. And that means having a unity of faith, a core doctrine of beliefs that we believe together, agreeing on the essentials of the faith, which you see in our confession of faith. We can disagree on a number of things, but there are some essential things we've got to hold together in order to grow together and to walk together, to be mature together. 
You know, churches often um, base success on a lot of things today. They pursue lots of things. But how often do you hear of churches saying, the one thing we want to pursue, and one of the top things we want to pursue as a church is Christian maturity? Well, that's what the Bible calls us to, that we would be a growing, mature church. Number two, that we would be sound in doctrine. Look at verse 13. To mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. See, Paul understands that a spiritually mature church is a doctrinally stable church, a church that can identify what the truth about the gospel is, the truth of who God is, what is the gospel, what is not the gospel. And that's something we want to prioritize as believers because there will always be false teachers lurking around to lead believers astray. And so you see another priority here that flows out of this devotion is that we're devoted to growing in maturity, but we're devoted to being sound in our doctrine and stable. But number three, we're also called to be devoted to authentic love. A spiritually mature and doctrinally grounded church is one that loves well. See it, don't you? Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from which from the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in what? Love. There's this theme of love that just continues to dominate time and time again. And it's no, no mistake that Jesus summarized the, the great commandments by what's the greatest commandment he was asked? He said, well, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and a second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus placed a priority on how we love one another. A spiritually mature and grounded church is one that loves well. This is a good reminder, I think, of some errors that we should do well to avoid that can often emerge within a church. Sometimes Christians can be so zealous about ensuring right doctrine that they develop a critical and mean spirit that is detrimental to Christian community. We want to avoid that. But on the other hand, there are others that are so devoted to the, call of, uh, to the call to love that they forget what we're founded upon, a set of convictions that need to be held and confessed together. So we're called to both. We're called to be a community that is deeply committed to the truth, to the true faith, and that's combined with a heart of love for others. So that's what the Bible points out when it talks about what a healthy community looks like. These type things that are mentioned, maturity, stability, and love. Deliberate simplicity is not so much about doing the bare minimum. That's not what we mean. Let's just do the minimum we can get away with. That's not what we're talking about. It's more about clarity of purpose as a biblical community. And these things become the driving aims that define whether or not we're being faithful, not whether or not we have something good going all the time. And what I wanna see, what I wanna see, and what I want us to see from this passage and others like it is the emphasis that the Bible places on what ought to drive our, our priority and focus as a church. Churches can become so preoccupied with things, even good things, and miss the point of what God is calling us to be together. Now, having said that, I want us to kind of see, and that was a fast run through 16 verses. That's not our norm if you're new to us. We don't typically do it that fast. I just wanted to kind of get a snapshot of kind of this church culture here. But I want us to see how these this, a text like this kind of informs this core value of deliberate simplicity. What do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is, number one, our priority will be people, not programs. Our priority will be people, not programs. We want to be a church that places a premium on people and their growth and their maturity, not maintaining a litany of programs that are ever-increasing. To be clear, 
we are not anti-program. We have them, right? The equip hour is a program, a structure that's in place to help us in our disciple making. Home groups are a program of sorts, children's ministry, student ministry. We have women's ministry programs that exist in the life of Redeeming Grace Baptist Church. We're not anti-program. We just don't want to over-programatize everything where you're always busy sustaining a program and not living in relationship with one another and building faithful community. We're even looking to launch a monthly gathering of young adults this summer. There's more to come on that, and we'll get back to you. You know, a book that is really, another book that's really influenced how I think about ministry is a book called Trellis and the Vine. And there in this, this book, uh, the, the authors are, are talking about how a trellis and a vine works. You got a trellis, right? You know what that is? Like this structure that a vine can attach to and grow on, right? The trellis exists to aid the vine. The vine is what is alive and what will be flowering or producing fruit of some kind. And so the trellis exists merely to support the growth of the vine, its growth and its maturity. The trellis exists for the vine. The vine does not exist for the trellis. Tony Payne says in that book, he says, trellis work often looks more impressive than vine work. It's more visible and structural. We can point to something tangible, a committee, an event, a program, a budget, an infrastructure, and say we have done something. We can build our trellis until it reaches to the heavens, but there still be very little growth in the vine. The point of this is simple. Here at Redeeming Grace, we believe in having a trellis. But it's the vine work that must always be our top priority. You are the vine, the people, not programs. We want, to, we want to support you. We want to help you grow in Christian maturity and eager to maintain unity. Not unleash a, a whole bunch of programs and try to force your, your attendance and participation in these things that may be good and wise and helpful from time to time, but not ultimately essential. So while we will have programs, our priority will be people. Number two, our focus is culture, not calendar. I love a good project. I love to develop, plan, and execute new things. Like I, I like doing that. I enjoy it. I find energy in it, right? Some of you, that would be the worst thing. But for me, that's what I enjoyed. So a huge temptation for me, now in this new building, in, in ministry especially, is, is to plan a bunch of new things and see what all we can do here in this church and, and all the rest. And I'm sure we will do new things. But friends, our focus, I know the focus of our elders, and even as a church, is on cultural development, not calendar additions. We deliberately have a simplistic calendar. That's on purpose. Right? We don't load the calendar down with all these things. Some churches fill their calendar with so many things, clutter, that you can literally be there four to five nights a week. If you're looking for that kind of church, you'll be sorely disappointed here. There will be things that get planned. There will be calendar. We look at a calendar every week in our staff meeting. Like we're not anti-calendar. We work by them and we operate by them and we add things to a calendar. But listen, a busy calendar doesn't mean a faithful church. Just because a church does a lot of things doesn't mean it's being fruitful, doesn't mean it's being faithful or effective or healthy. So we will plan, we will have events, but our greater focus is helping you grow and be equipped so that you can be the church. I'd rather ha you have time throughout the week to practice hospitality to do life together with other believers than have something to attend yet again here. Our focus is culture, not calendar. And our strategy is simple, not complex. Our mission statement, statement really does drive the things that we do here at Redeeming Grace. Our mission statement reads simply, we exist as a family of Christ followers that exalt the Lord, equip disciples, and engage the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's pretty simple. 
Exalt, equip, engage. Churches use all kinds of different words and with nice little, little, um, what's the, acronyms, thank you. Acronyms to, to, to say the same thing, but that's ours. Exalt, equip, engage. It's pretty simple. That's our strategy. What are we about? We're about exalting, making much of Jesus. We're about equipping, making disciples, training you, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And we're about engaging, serving one another, serving our community, serving the nations with the gospel, and making disciples there as well. That's not complex. That's pretty simple. And that's what we want for each one of you individually. We want to see you as Christians kind of make movement through all of these areas where all three of these things become kind of the, the, the aim of your life. To exalt the Lord. It's great that you're gathered here to exalt Jesus today, but what are you doing about growing and equipping and being equipped? Aging the world, your neighbors. See, we want to see those who gather regularly. We want to see those who grow in truth and faithfulness. We want to see those who go and serve and make disciples. We want to see you living out all three of these priorities. And we have structures, we have trellises in place that aid that, but they're not an end in and of themselves. They exist to facilitate the kind of faithful, growing, Christ-exalting community we strive to become. So our strategy is simple, not complex. That's what we mean by deliberate simplicity. We believe we've been called to build a church culture that prioritizes a healthy culture, not a church that maintains its clutter. At the end of the day, deliberate simplicity means we want to be a faithful and fruitful community of Christians. Distinct in our culture, deliberate in our culture, devoted in our culture, that's centered all around the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that we would seek to live out this mission together, exalting, equipping, and engaging. Deliberately simple, but biblically driven. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity just to think through really what should set the tone of who we're called to be. Lord, we can do a lot of good things together. There are a lot of great ideas. There are a lot of good ministries that exist today. And we, in no way do we want to draw any kind of negativity towards such things. Lord, we do some of them ourselves. But Father, we just want to pause this morning and recognize that we can be so busy doing and we can become so cluttered in our lives as Christians that we forget what matters most. And so, Lord, would you help us to be a people who cherish the truth of your word, who cherish the truth of the gospel, who are eager to maintain unity around that, who, who strive to grow in maturity, stable in truth and doctrine, authentic in how we love and care for each other. And Lord, as long as these things are primary and prominent in our church, Lord, we can do lots of things or we can not. And so, Lord, would you help us to make these our driving ambition? And Father, however that would mean that we would need certain structures in place to assist and to aid that, then Lord, help us to do it. But Lord, help us not to be a church that's cluttered with all kinds of good ideas. Lord, help us to be a church that portrays a healthy culture committed to faithfulness and fruitfulness to the glory of Christ our King. Lord, we give this to you. We ask for your help. It's not easy. Lord, we live in a world that's complex and that wants to make things complicated and hard. And so, Lord, our tendency often is to run headlong into all kinds of activity and, and forget who it is we're called to be. So, Lord, help us to keep our priorities straight and our focus biblical, that we may bear much fruit for your glory, for the good of others, for the advance of the gospel to the nations. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.